hear anything <clears throat> they haven't started the presentation just yet i think they're trying to figure out a way to get it working okay th 
Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Who is this? Anyway. <laughs> uh, I didn't get to bed until one, two o'clock this morning. So, I, this for all of you folks that are superstitious, and that's just, that's one reason I'm, I'm here with this program. Uh, planetariums, their history and use. I also should have put on there why we need a planetarium. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later. Oh, let's see what else is on here. That is not a planetarium. This is the general public's idea when they come to visit a planetarium, this is a planetarium. Even an observatory, they're supposed to have the telescopes sticking out the freaking dome on it, you know. By the way, this, this is public domain, so I don't have to pay for it. 
No, turn that light back on, please. You have to be given orders to make a misstep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is not a planetarium. What is it? What is it, Jim? Ori. Ori. Spell that for us. O R R E R Y. Dang, a genius in the crowd. No, my mother was an English teacher. <laughs> oh, you just took your speller home and learned how yeah. to. Yeah, okay. We had spelling contests at our home. That's not a planetarium either. But you can buy these globes and things that they have a light bulb in place of the Earth. And it will show a silhouette or shadow of all the constellations on your ceiling. And if you're sophisticated like me, you got a dome and you sign it up on that. I have an observatory dome and I have done that. <laughs> you don't know. I'll laugh a lot. Okay. So what is a planetarium? I had to plagiarize this because I didn't know what a planetarium was. They had to tell me, you know. So, what? It's, 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 it's 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 the Hit the back button. <clears throat> the arrow. There you go. I'm very slow on the buttons. I, I don't think that'll work. The left arrow on the number key. Mm -hmm. See the arrows? Hit the left, the one, the left. Oh, yeah. There we go. The planetarium is a sky theater. That's the other problem we have with planetariums. People think when they walk in the planetarium, we get that question all the time, even though it's obvious in this planetarium, this is not a real sky. They think they're actually looking through a transparent dome, I guess, or something that those planetarium lectures have all this power to be able to rotate the stars, you know, and change the position. So there, the planetarium is a sky theater where the special projectors create a simulation of the night sky on a dome ceiling. Uh, special projectors. Uh, that's not, that's out of order. But anyway, let me take that back because I got to talk. Back in the 13th century, we had the Crusades. Europe had the Crusades. Us folks in the United States didn't exist, so we didn't have anything to do with that. Our ancestors might. Not if they're Arabs. Well, we're Europeans were in the Crusades. Euro Europeans went after the Arabs, yeah. Or Muslims. Different religion. Anyway, we don't want to get into that. That's a different thing. So... As you know, the conqueror goes to spoil us, and this genius who only he stole a, a planetarium, better not. And it was a dome tent that rotated, and it had holes in the tent, so you had to use it in the daytime, and it showed the stars. And I think there have different, been different versions of that have come over the years, down to even to us. And uh, I brought a similar illustration. Anybody notice anything wrong with this umbrella? <laughs> we don't need that anyway. Well, look, if you take and create your artificial horizon here with the desktop, you can actually, and turn this to your latitude, you can see what constellations and what time they're going to arise. No planets, of course, because they kind of move around the sky, so you, you can't uh, show them. I was in the... Uh, SEPA conference uh, a few months ago at the Space Flight Center. 
that Gabrielle and David and maybe you guys will get to do that too. Say hi to Gabrielle. Gabrielle runs the Space Camp program. And David is the director of this planetarium and the party. Uh, you have to forgive them. They may probably tell you when you get there. But due to COVID, which has screwed everybody over in the whole country for the last two years, uh, they've lost personnel. So they really don't have enough people to do all their programs that they want to do. Uh, but they put on a great show for us for four days. Uh, talk about devotees, you gotta go to something all about astronomy for four days, you know, and sit. And fellow that sells Zeiss projectors, which is in the next slide, sort of, you know, there's something great about the year 1923. What happened to us? E.E. Um, e. Bernard died, you know, Nashville. He, uh, and so people, group of people got together and they created the Barnard Astronomical Society here in Chattanooga. Later on, many decades later, they created the Barnard Astronomical and Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society. Well, anybody that knows anything about galaxies in Seaford knows that uh, that was sometime in the 1960s or something like that. I knew him, so <laughs> he was director of the Dyer Observatory in Nashville. So the first projector, as you see here, in August of 1923, the first Zeiss planetarium projected images of the night sky onto a white plaster lining 16 meter, anybody know what 16 meters is? It's a, a meter is about this long. 45 about 45 feet, yeah. That's big. And uh, <laughs> when you see the projector, you understand why they had to do that. Uh, Hemispherical concrete dome erected on the roof of the Zeiss Works, I assume in Jena. And first official program done with a Another projector was in Munich in 1923. I don't know how many of you know it. How many motions do you think the Earth has? I was three. shocked. Huh? At least three. <laughs> yeah, we have three. We orbit around the sun. We rotate daily. Huh? And we have precession. We have 19 motions because that procession doesn't <laughs> does this kind of thing, and it's all also the procession point moves. So that's just some of them. You can look it up and see what happens. As we found out when we started sending up satellites, when the United States started sending up satellites, the Russians all they had was a beeping thing that went around. They couldn't tell what it was doing. It didn't measure anything, uh, but we sent up more sophisticated satellites and measured the Earth, and the Earth is sort of pear-shaped, even though there's very, you know, it's, you know how it is when you get pear-shaped, <laughs> you kind of wobble, <laughs> so, especially if you're four thousand, four million, what is it, four billion years old, so. Uh, I think I, if the slide is in the right sequence, there's an illustration of the projector. And what I was telling you is, it took three years of a bunch of mathematicians and professors, astronomy, and engineers at Zeiss to create this little monster here. And of course, it has a light bulb and shining through slides. So these are a bunch of slide projectors. And these are the planets. Where's the computer control? <laughs> well, it's more or less automatic. But it's purely uh, mechanical. Though. But you have to set it. 
you know, if you want to show the actual sky the way it is. And same we have to do here, Greg. <laughs> Greg volunteered to help me fix this thing in here, our projector. So it took three years to develop this before they actually just built a model of it, which is this one. And uh, I, I don't remember, I didn't read whether it still existed. I'm, I bet it does because, well, of course, we had a little thing called World War II that kind of messed things up in Germany. So who knows? Later on, they created the dumbbell projector. So it would show, see, that other projector only showed the northern hemisphere, you know, around Munich. Munich's what, about 40 degrees latitude, I think. I'm not sure. My girlfriend is a little bit north of there. But <laughs> uh, so this is at Adler Planetarium. This was the first optical projector in the United States. I don't know how many millions or a million dollars this thing costs. Do you know about what year that was? 1930. Okay. And uh, as you see, they put around the horizon of, of the uh, skyline of Chicago. And I could be wrong. It could be Hayden. That'd be New York. <laughs> but uh, they had the, you set around it. Now, this thing is on a cart. So when it wasn't being used, it was slid out into the lobby so people could see it operate. Sort of like when you started IMAX theaters, you could you could go look at the the film running around and stuff like that, you know. So what you're getting paid, what you're paying for. The fourth planetarium like this was built, it's called Hayden. And everybody thinks, what's his name? Neil somebody? Uh, he's the he's the head man as far as everybody in the public wants to know. But there's a little guy who I met. <laughs> he shocked me, man. His name is Carter, and he runs the place. And uh, he was at our meeting at SEPA. And I never had so much fun. You talking about meeting an old hippie? That was him. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't have him here. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll have him here for a program because he'll definitely come and he'll tell you all about Hayden. And of course, there's the Adler Planetarium, the first gigantic planetarium I ever went to. And uh, that was at an Astronomical League convention in Chicago in 1968. Oh, that was a fun year, especially in Chicago. I called the president of the club of Chicago uh, Astronomical Club and asked if it was safe for my wife and I to come to the convention. And he says, oh, yes. Well, I work for IBM. Someone set off a bomb in front of the building, you know, <laughs> over there. This was during the riots at the Democratic Convention in 1968. The good thing about it was I got a room at the Hilton Hotel for my wife and I for $16 a night. <laughs> and guess who was in charge of the security of Chicago? The president of the Astronomical Club, <laughs> who I talked to on the phone. <laughs> That's just a little side note. But uh, Adler has, has changed completely now. Now they did have down in the basement of the Adler at that time, they had a telescope making class and they had antique telescopes, but now they've increased the size of the under, underground and they have a museum all under the ground. I haven't been there to that new one, but I've talked to someone who's, who works there and they told me what I'm missing. <laughs> there you go, 1930. First American planetarium with a electromechanical, optical mechanical planetarium projector. 
they were so being so precise is that they show the sky as close to the reality as you could. And the slides were copper plates that they had little holes punched in to represent the stars and the slides. And they continue on doing that for quite a while with the, they built the same projector. They just changed the name. See, that was Mark II. You saw Mark I in Munich. And Atlanta, Georgia has a Mark III, I think. So there's a lot of those big dumbbell monsters all around here in the United States. Like I said, they cost a million bucks or more. You're talking about a program to raise money to build one of these things. Now, Zeiss is still, as far as I'm concerned, number one is producing planetary projectors. Number two is Goto and Japan. That's just my opinion. But uh, they produce a realistic sky. I'll tell you more about that later. What? I don't want that. What's that say? Just click off that. This man, like I said, those projectors cost millions of dollars. And of course, having had like, these big buildings and seating and everything, a planetarium costs a lot of money. Uh, this man here is an Armin Spitz. I met Armin Spitz. He's a he was a big guy, had a big laugh, and I can hear him in my brain right now. <laughs> uh, he was a volunteer at the Fells Museum Planetarium in Philadelphia, I think it is. The other uh, planetarium projector built like that, other than Phil's, is that was called uh, Bula or something like that. I can't remember where that one is. Pittsburgh, I think, Pennsylvania. But, and it just closed. Well, Armin Spitz come up with this thing. He called it the A1 projector. You see that there's, this is just a projector to show the equator. And he had a little light to light up the inside of the dome to produce an artificial sky, you know. But of course, the projector is a projector. All the stars are drilled holes in these plastic panels. And uh, how he calculated all that, or who, somebody else helped him. <laughs> I don't think Harmon had to. Uh, and this figure here is called a dodectrohedron. It's a 12 sided five-sided, you know, planes. And Albert Einstein consulted, told him, said this was the closest you could get to a sphere and had flat surfaces because trying to calculate these things on a sphere. We'll get it in here. Now, when we built our planet here, here in, in uh, 1958, it's a 24 foot dome, plastered for about four inches thick with steel reinforcements, wire like, in, like you do concrete. So Zeiss didn't have anything on us. <laughs> and uh, I don't know where some of you have seen the projector. And our projector that we've had so for so many years seated 20 people in the library with a cardboard dome built at Warner Park field house or shop. They have a hobby shop used to in, in Warner Park. So you could go there. They had all of the machinery you need, you know, drill press, planes, all kinds of, you know, joiners. You could do all kinds of wood stuff in it. So Llewellyn Evans, Chester Martin, 
which I discovered had died in March. I, hold, I want them to be guests here with me. <laughs> so, no Chester Martin. Chester Martin is a, one of the Chattanooga's best well-known artists. He created medals for uh, Congress and other things. Plus, he does great paintings and illustrations. Oh, he did. But anyway, that's another story. I knew him when he was chasing some Australian exchange students so. <laughs> at UC. <laughs> uh, I got off the subject. But anyway, this one, my little orb here, so it has little holes in it. And you put a little light bulb inside. I'm sorry I couldn't find, I have the whole thing. This is just a spare globe I stole from somewhere. And, oh, I got another, uh, well, anyway, that was the A1. Trying to get to the story is, there was an Astronomical League convention in Atlanta. Armin Spitz, uh, Edmund of Edmund Scientific, and a an, an astronomer, I don't know what anybody remembers who he is, called Harlow Shapley. Anybody know who he is? That's too bad. I met him and I thought he was a great guy, but he's a little short guy. But Harlow Shapley is one that discovered the center of our galaxy by plotting the positions of the globular clusters. He's the guy that the rate the classifications are named after? Yeah, the is he? Okay. <laughs> but anyway, that's the history of the Astronomical Society. Astronomical League, I think it was founded in 51 or something like that. I used to be very active in the Astronomical League. I was even an officer, so. But anyway, he came up here because he found out we had a planetarium, you know, in, the, in our library. And we had a dodecahedron. Well, he told Clarence Jones, who was still alive at that time. Now, I get this story from his son, Arthur Jones. How true all this is, I don't know. But anyway, our dodecahedron is not made of plastic. It's made out of copper sheets. And uh, I don't know who plotted each one of the stars. There's about 300 stars on that projector. And, uh, but anyway, it had something else that Armin Spitz did not have on his projectors. This is, this is the A1A. It, uh, as you see, it has lenses for the bright stars. And there's Tommy Atkins, the next old guy around here. Uh, and he, it does project some planets and other things like that. But anyway, it makes it sharper images and brighter stars for the bright stars. Look back to the story. His first projector had the light bulb in it and it rotated all around the dome and on the floor. So... Our projector has a cup that is gimbaled inside the projector and the light bulb sits in that club. And of course it has a, a wire going to it. And when the dodecahedron rotates, that stays still. And so at the, at the horizon, so there's no stars going on the floor. So I'm going to spit so Joan says, if, if you uh, let me put that on my projectors, I'll not sue you for patent infringement. <laughs> so this was the 1953, 50, I think, 53 model or so. And it has copper plates and it does have the cutoff horizon, which in her uh, planetarium language means the spring line. I don't know why it's called spring line. That's a horizon in a planetarium, artificial horizon. 
Now, when you go down to Huntsville, you see that planetarium down there. Their dome is tilted. So the horizon, you know, is tilted. <laughs> but they use it for movies. They don't use it really for... That's, a, that's another deal. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah, those are my spits. And you can see the dome. They, he also started selling domes, too. And there's the Spitz Jr., which you could buy for $15. Yeah, 15 bucks. It projects about, you know, less than 100 stars, most of the bright stars, just to show the constellations. It doesn't illustrate the constellations, it just shows stars. You have to have the smarts enough to connect the dots. And since all societies have different ideas what a constellation consists, you get to connect the dots any old way you want to, which many of us do. We got the Big Dipper, you know, we call them asterisms, but, and some people call it the bear, some people call it the plow, some people call it the dipper, and that's the way it goes. And the wagon, I forgot about the wagon. It's called, in England, it's called the wagon. Planetarium today, the theater devoted to popular education, entertainment in astronomy and related fields, especially space science, traditionally constructed with a hemisphere dome ceiling that is used as a screen onto which images of stars and planets and other celestial objects are projected. Well, when they invented this thing, that's when people started inventing the digital projectors for projecting on the dome and we had cinerama you know what is it cinema scope cinerama only it used three projectors so it was not wide field project you know lenses or projectors but the uh, and then we get to the imax which really spreads it out on the 70 millimeter film but these They started putting those big wide angle lenses on it. <laughs> the projector costs maybe anywhere from two thousand to four thousand dollars for the projector, but the lens costs ten thousand dollars. <laughs> and uh we're hope to have, aren't we? We have Zeiss and Digitalis said they would bring a projector here for us to take a look at. I hope we get to do that. I'm crazy about it. <laughs> so who knows? Somebody's doing huh? Oh shoot, that don't show up too well. Hmm? Do what? Turn the light on. Oh, no, don't turn the light on. Yeah, I'll go ahead and turn the light up. <laughs> now it's turn the light on. Reach up there behind you and just turn the light. Can I turn it on? This picture here is probably one of the first you've seen it uh, when the Hayden Planetarium first on its grand opening had this kind of image projected and talking and giving a tour of the solar system with no other than Tom Hanks uh, narrating the, the show. And this is similar, if you go down to the Space and Science Center, except for, it's tilted, it's right in front of you and you got t theater seats. So everybody has a front row seat. And uh, like heck- the one that's down close to Carsville. What's that? The space there's down close to Carsville. On Huntsville. Yeah, yeah. Space and Science Center is in uh, He's talking about Huntsville. Okay. You're talking about TELUS. Yeah. Yeah, they got a decent one. Yeah, TELUS has what they call a mega, a mega globe projector. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't give you two cents for one of those, even though Phil Gross, a friend of mine, sells those things. Oh, yeah. And he's only about four feet tall. 
<laughs> he's he's from uh, uh, Macon, Georgia. And uh, that's what I have. Now we got to go. Why do we have to have planetariums? Anybody got any ideas? Well, first thing, the planetariums are getting away from really educational things. You know, I sat through, I don't know, 100 Dagum planetarium shows, and only one mentioned anything about actual sky. You know, about, you know, really celestial mechanics and how the sky works, how the earth rotates and all that stuff. Didn't have anything about that. Now, all of you went down to the uh, Walker County Science Center to uh, Jim Smith Planetarium and saw the sky quest, did you not? Where's the sky? <laughs> <laughs> and answered that question. Didn't it? <laughs> yes, Smith Planetarium. It's in Ch Chattanooga. I mean, uh, Chickamauga. It's, it's down near my house. Uh, they have a 40 foot dome, which I helped tear apart and had it installed there. Thank goodness I had nothing to do with the installation. It fell. And some people were injured, so. I don't want to get sued. I, I wasn't there. And they didn't follow my instructions. I've been a consultant on taking down planetariums and putting planetariums up. And uh, I was not involved in what happened down there. Uh, so it doesn't exist. What's that? It doesn't exist. No, it's still there. Oh, it's still there. They repaired it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well. Like this place and that place, I have very emotional attachments and stuff that went on in both places, I can't stand. So, uh, but anyway, any any ideas why we need planetariums? There you go. One of the number one problems is the light pollution. But what does the light pollution do? It lights up the air pollution. Uh, and of course, the new LED lights are blue. And blue light scatters. That's the reason the sky is blue. <laughs> and uh, so we have those. Well, you can't really see the stars. You know, you can see some of the bright ones in some places. I even heard of people taking pictures and doing things on, in Manhattan. From their apartment from their apartment buildings so anything is possible but you know it's education too and try to get people aware but if you don't go and don't support them then it's it don't work so you don't come here to this observatory on the public nights or university nights when we're invited you're not supporting it you know and it goes dead, it'll go away. And, and there's so many planetariums and so many people I've known who are well-educated in astronomy. They don't get paid much in the first place. You know, they like a lot of, most teachers, they're devoted to the subject and to their students. So they don't get paid much. You know, you get $60,000 a year, you're lucky. You know, you start out like 30,000 or something, you know. And the people in the planetarium says, oh, he's just a tech, you know, in the planetarium. He don't get anything hardly, but they're there. And uh, that's that's my preaching from right now. Any questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> One of my problems is, at my nearly 84 years old, is I can't hear. I said, don't take a job in the planetarium. <laughs> I tell you, I was in hog heaven when I worked over in Kinston, North Carolina as a consultant. I went over there to consult and dedic you know, sort of dedicate the planetarium there because the projector, wait a minute, no, the dome that we had, I took down at Rock Springs, Georgia, just not seven miles from me. 
and uh, the uh, oh, what's that river? Anyway, the museum over there bought that dome, a twenty-four foot dome, and they put it in a twenty-four foot room. <laughs> I had detailed instructions illustrating what all the little pieces and the panels and everything go. And when I got over there, uh, they had the dome up. And I asked the guys that put it up, I said, how'd you get that dome in this room? Because it was 24 feet in diameter inside. But the room inside diameter is also 24 feet. Anybody knows anything, you know, the, the support structure of the of the dome was outside that 24 feet. He said, we sort of tilted it up and old John over there, he got up there and he jumped up and down on the edge of it and he finally got it in the room. <laughs> Bobby, will you give a tour of the planetarium to anybody that hasn't been in of there? Course. We've got some new members that haven't probably of been Of course. Can you show it to them? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, always. Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you. And thanks, Matt, here for coming up with this idea. So I heard you say when the ECT re resumes that you will be there on Sunday night once a um, month, and you do plan to do it for the. Yo, know, what is it? The twenty third. Yo, twenty third. What time? Clock time. <laughs>